Education Commission to order at seven minutes after six. Can you call the roll, please? Sure. Uh, Council Member Eaton? Here. Uh, Commissioner Jameson? Here. Commissioner Peleg? Here. Commissioner Mursky? Here. Chair Appleyard? Here. Commissioner Levine? Here. Oh, it's and, Levin, by the way. Oh, Levin, thank you. <laughs> uh, and then Commissioner Colin Garcia? Here. Thank you. Uh, approval of the agenda. Does anyone have any changes or suggestions or alterations to the agenda as written? If not, I'll call for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Here, second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Approval of the minutes. Which are not in your packet. Which side? But were sent to this us. Yeah, this morning. Yeah, this yeah. Earlier today. yeah, I didn't read them. Yeah, why don't we uh, postpone that since I don't think anybody's read them? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Public input. As you all know, we do have public, but they're quiet. <laughs> the silent uh, majority? Yeah. But anyways, oh, we'll have one that has plenty to say in a few yeah. minutes. So, seeing no input from the public, we'll move on to the energy report. All right. So kind of uh, some internal news um, and also an item for the next agenda. Uh, Honeywell will be doing a presentation for us at our next energy uh, commission meeting. Um, we did have uh, some questions for them and they're getting back to us. So we're waiting for those um, to do the presentation. That, that's a September meeting, right? We so, don't have one. Yeah, anymore, so right? as of right now, it would be in September. Um, another thing that's come up, uh, Yellowfin. So internally we've been trying to integrate uh, some of our uh, data sources. We have an assessor's office, uh, audit uh, kind of database. Uh, we're trying to see if we can perhaps integrate some of these uh, to be more educated in the way that we approach energy efficiency. Um, so if we have information, for example, on furnaces, how long it's been since a permit's been uh, pulled, can we go ahead and cross-reference some of these databases to, to better uh, get energy efficiency to where it's needed? Um, so we've been talking to IT about that. There's a chance we'll be having a presentation on Yellowfin. Yellowfin's kind of the application that allows to cross-reference all these uh, data sources together. Um, that's another thing on the horizon. Uh, this month, uh, we also have a dashboard that will be completed by the end of July. Uh, I have collected all of uh, the different data sources for that as well. Uh, and uh, the graphs should be up uh, by the end of July. If anyone who's interested, go ahead and shoot me an email uh, if you want to see them beforehand and we can work together to, to make sure. Of what? What's the dashboard of? So it's a sustainability dashboard okay. online. Um, and it ties to the sustainability framework gotcha. yeah. and the yeah. goals in the framework. Yeah. Great. And this is a couple of months, <laughs> at least in the making. So <laughs> I'm glad that we'll finally have that up uh, for the public to see. Um, on a kind of uh, unrelated issue, um, there is also, so the, the Solar Faithful, uh, and I'm not sure how much we've gone into this uh, with commission, but the Solar Faithful is a, a kind of a program where we attempt to find a, a way to put solar panels on nonprofits. Specifically, Solar Faithful has mostly been concentrated on uh, houses of worship. So we've gotten houses of worship who are interested in putting panels or solar panels on their roofs. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, you know, we can't actually collect the tax credit for nonprofits. So the whole idea with the Solar Faithful program has been, uh, can we find a way to be able to collect the tax credit to benefit from that and put solar on these houses of worship? Um, we've been working uh, with a, um, a law firm from California uh, and we're actually going to be having a open house uh, July 25th um, from 7 to 8.30 at Campus Chapel. That's uh, Washtenaw Court uh, 1236. Uh, and we've opened it up to all nonprofits. So I did meet with uh, Carlene uh, Colvin Garcia, and we talked a bit about the interest that schools might have in this. Uh, I went back to the Solar Faithful team, and we decided to open it up to any nonprofit who could benefit from these LLC PPA models. 
if you guys have any suggestions, please uh, touch base with me and, and we'll definitely invite them as well. Can we invite private schools, for example, Green Hills and uh, entities like that as well? Seems as long as they're a nonprofit entity. Yeah, um, uh, I assume they're, I don't know if they're a nonprofit. Yeah. That's a good question. Th that's kind of the, yeah, yep. that's the main. What's the date again, Josh, sorry? Yeah, uh, July 25th uh, at Campus Chapel from 7 to 8.30 p.m. And that's uh, Washtenaw Court 1236. And the uh, law firm that we've been working with is Clean Tech out of California. We'll actually have uh, one of the benefits to doing this open house. We'll have someone from Clean Tech there. Uh -huh. So if there are any questions, uh, get more in detail mm -hmm. on these documents and, and how they can be used, uh, we have that as well. And the documents going to be available at the time? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. We can definitely make them ahead of time available for anyone who's interested. Um, they'll also be at the meeting themselves. Obviously, we'll be going through them, so sure. we'll be handing them. If you guys are interested. Uh, since we're working with uh, Michigan Interfaith and uh, Power and Lighting, have we thought about reaching out to houses of worship outside the Ann Arbor area? I know the pilot mm -hmm. area was originally just Ann Arbor area, but maybe yeah. this is an event that might be worth extending a broader invitation net out yeah so um we had eight houses of worship that were actually interested in pursuing uh, getting solar on on their roofs um of those uh we have about four or five who are pursuing the llc ppa model uh roughly uh, i've talked a little bit with michigan ipl and they're going to go ahead and reach out to their larger uh networks to see if anyone else in the area um for some of these open houses so this is actually the third open house that the solar faithful team have uh, put on and uh, for uh, previous uh, open houses, we've actually had houses of worship from the Detroit area mm -hmm. and kind of the, the wider uh, southeastern Michigan area. So, so yeah, how, how does it work? So they, so if you've got a church, they're already tax exempt. They, they go ahead and put the solar panels on and then the city gets the tax credit? No, um, the way to think about it is kind of leasing your roof. Yeah. So the idea would be you'd create an LLC uh, that would then enter into a PPA with a house of worship. Okay. The house of worship would put the solar panels on their roof. The LLC would technically own the panels, mm -hmm. but the house of worship would benefit from the energy being created from those solar panels. So you know, roughly you'd be saving based off of what you'd be spending on electricity to DTE versus uh, whatever is being generated on these solar panels themselves. And so how does the city get involved it's we're, not a we're city just, thing we're, we're basically just going and and, uh, and helping to put this all together we, we're, we're not actually involved in connecting the, this exactly yeah this we're bringing LLC together resources to so that people can use, specifically gotcha. nonprofits can use them okay. we're not personally benefiting in any way or involved okay. in any in okay. any way so gotcha. are we talking about creating new LLCs or ones that are already existing are going to come in and invest yeah. in these so um, we are exploring actually having congregation members create LLCs. Okay. Uh, the interest, so we, we reached out to congregation members. Uh, we had conversations with them. Obviously, one of the largest hurdles they had for putting in and installing solar uh, was kind of the upfront capital cost. Um, but there were congregation members that were very interested in uh, investing for their house of worship in these kind of panels. Uh, of course, that kind of got us into a it's a very uh, intricate web of legal and attorney <laughs> kind of, you know, trying to create documents that would allow them to do that. Uh, and this is where kind of clean tech has come in, where we've been able to partner with a law firm out of California to help us, help them uh, create these kind of LLCs within congregation members. Um, and, and I could see this model, one of the reasons why, uh, you know, we really want to open this up to other nonprofits. I could see the way that this model might work in schools and other places as well. Uh, you know, if you have parents, for example, who are interested in investing, or so. Um, so I think, yeah, there's a lot to be to be gained from that point of view. Great. Yeah. All right. Um, as far as external information, uh, let's see. There is uh, currently tentative dates for the new power hours. Um, I know at our last meeting we talked a little bit about Michigan Saves and the pilot program that we were thinking about putting on with them. Uh, Emily has reached out uh, to the libraries. Uh, currently they're looking at uh, early August 
early to mid-August uh, mm -hmm. time frame uh, to have uh, these kind of informational sessions on energy efficiency and renewables for the public. Um, DTE will be involved, Michigan Saves, as well as some of our commissioners. Uh, so those are, those are yet to be set, but it's all in the works on that front. Um, let's what, what are the top, what are the topics that are being presented yeah. for these informational sessions? So Michigan Saves will be talking about finance options they have for energy efficiency, so how to finance for mostly residential. Um, finance energy efficiency upgrades and renewable upgrades. There will also be, uh, DT will be doing some uh, informational sessions on um, some of the rebate program. So for example, if you have a furnace or a refrigerator, they have some rebates they can use on that end. Um, and then our energy commission is gonna be mostly touching on renewables, specifically solar, uh, with more kind of an expertise on, on that side. As of right now, no. Um, there is a kind of related uh, topic that I have uh, for the commission. We have a EV readiness uh, plan that's coming out, so we've been working on it internally. Um, so that, that is kind of alongside, uh, but not exactly. Uh, not part of the power hour plan. Exactly, okay. yeah. All right. yeah. All right. But we do have things moving on that side too. <laughs> cool. Uh, let's see. And I think that's pretty much it for me. Okay, I wanted to just mention, and I haven't seen all the details on it yet, and I don't know whether Charlotte knows mm -hmm. any more about it or not, but DTE has filed their tariff, and uh, they now are proposing a direct generation um, tariff that basically gives you, it's the monthly average cost, their cost of, of buying electricity, and but then they add what they call a service excess charge, which is determined by how big your array is, and so that they're basically plan. if I understand this correctly, they're going to tax you, they're going to charge you for you generating electricity and using it on your own home. Yeah. And we'll, and that better not make it through the MPSC, but we'll see. Yeah, it's a fixed, so. Your mic's um, It's, so, um, yes, yeah, so you would still pay, it, so they just filed, so there's a 10 month, it, as part of a rate case, there's a 10 month, 10 month process before the Public Service Commission makes a decision, um, and, uh, essentially, you would still pay the retail rates, so like 14 or 15 cents a kilowatt hour for what you take off the grid. Um, and then for what you put back on the grid, then you would get credited at this much, much, much lower rate. And there would be a fixed charge attached um, to your bill, um, which varies based on the size of your array. So it's pretty onerous. Um, and, uh, you know, my opinion does not reflect cost of service for... Um, the customers who have solar and I think that if it were to go through we would definitely see a huge drop in the market in terms of um, folks wanting to do solar because the economics just wouldn't be there anymore uh, so I think I mean there's a lot of other stuff in the DT rate case there's also the EV program that they just put mm -hmm. in for and there's a few other things so it might be a good um, topic uh, for s September to do a, a like have somebody do a presentation on um, the various components of the of the case because I think there are definitely opportunities for Ann Arbor to weigh in it weigh in both on the good side on some pieces and then obviously push back on some um, other things that are going to make it more difficult for us to hit our energy and climate goals. It did include a thirteen million dollar program to incentivize EV charging stations, which is good. Um, but uh, yeah, so. This tariff would take, would be, would go into effect in April or May of next year, most likely. So, people who are in the DTE territory and will want to put solar on their roof, they might want to do it soon. Yeah. Because <laughs> even if it gets changed by the NPSC, it's it's not going to be net metering. There's also a clause in there if you add to the size of your system, 
your entire system goes into their, e even you are net metering, your, your entire system would go into the, the uh, distributed generation program. Is this separate from their decision to change net metering? I thought that was no, independent of that. Yeah, so this is the, so in 2016, the legislature overhauled our um, state energy laws, and there was a fierce debate around net metering. Um, the utilities obviously wanted to uh, move to a version um, similar to what DTE has filed that would um, drastically reduce the compensation for folks for the energy they put back on the grid. Uh, we, on the other side, were pushing um, to say that net metering is pretty rough justice in terms of the costs and benefits, and so we should keep it in place, or at the very least, we should do a methodology to figure out a rate that's fair. Um, and so they worked out a compromise um, and asked the Public Service Commission to develop a tariff for distributed generation that reflected cost of service. The commission uh, staff did a report, um, held a pretty decent stakeholder process, um, and then the commission came out with a fairly vague order, um, essentially saying, you know, we're not really sure here. We think that the inflow should be the retail rate. Um, we're not sure exactly what the outflow rate should be. Um, the staff had recommended maybe the purple rate, which is about nine and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Um, but the commission sort of hedged its bets on that and said, okay, utilities in your next rate case, come back to us with your proposal for a tariff for what this should look like. And so that's where we're in now, is now DT is the first the first rate case after June 1 of 2018 um, to come in. Uh, and so they are the first in the door with a proposal in terms of what this tariff in their service tariff should look like. Um, so I think, one, it's really important, obviously, for uh, folks in the DT service territory for the commission to get this right. But it also will set the stage for other rate cases down the line um, for the rest of the state, too. So. Any other energy news people would like to relate? Okay, then moving right along, uh, we are going to be presented with a presentation from Jeff Alson on, on CAFE standards. Looking forward to this. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jeff Alson. I'm an engineer and a longtime city resident. I recently retired from the US EPA facility on Plymouth Road after a 40-year career. I should emphasize that because I'm retired, I'm speaking on behalf of myself as a private citizen and not EPA. I did spend a decade working on the car greenhouse gas standards that we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, and I can talk about that for a long time, but I have uh, eight slides, and I'm thinking that'll take probably 15 or 20 minutes to go through that. I'm going to try to summarize what's been a decade-long uh, substantive and process uh, in eight slides, uh, but I'll be happy to talk as long as anybody wants to afterwards with any questions. I met John a few weeks ago and he said he was interested in this topic and wanted to draft a resolution, a resolution and uh, I view my presentation as an endorsement of the resolution. So the EPA lab is on Plymouth Road across from North Campus, probably most of you know that. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as one of Ann Arbor's best kept secrets. Um, it's been there since 1971. It's not a regional lab. It's not just a vehicle testing lab. It's really the core of EPA's national uh, vehicle pollution control program. And we've really been the global leader in that field. Uh, we were the first country to regulate car pollution. Uh, Europe and Japan sat on the sidelines to see whether this experiment was going to work or not. It was very controversial at the time. It was the first time the car had really been regulated. And it's turned out to be a big success story for the country and for the globe. Um, we regulate all kinds of vehicles. I'll be talking about car, you know, personal vehicles, cars and SUVs and pickups and minivans. We regulate everything from lawnmowers up to ocean-going vessels and jets. So anything that moves and pollutes we're responsible for. Uh, on the car side, for most of our existence, we focused on what I call health-related pollution, not climate or greenhouse gases. 
And the tremendous news there is that new cars produced today are 99% cleaner for health-related pollution compared to the cars that my parents were buying back in the 1960s. Um, uh, this Im greatly improved improvement in car pollution has led to big improvements in air quality and public health. Um, uh, total um, um, automotive health-related emissions is down by about 70%, even as the economy has tripled since we started regulating vehicles back around 1970. Uh, scientists, not me, but scientists who do epidemiological studies project that we save about 200,000 lives per year in the U.S. because of the cleaner vehicles that we now have. And I'm convinced that without the type of program we've done at EPA, we'd have more U.S. cities look like those pictures we see in the New York Times of Mumbai and Beijing and Delhi, where you can't hardly see a block ahead of you and people are wearing masks and kids can't go outside and play and all that. The U.S. program has become a model for the rest of the world, and almost every other country now, really every country that has a big automotive market has, has modeled their program after the U.S. program. They all haven't gone as far as we've gone, and they haven't always had the successful enforcement that we've had, but they've all tried to copy some of our model. And lastly, and a point I like to make that a lot of people don't realize, even in my own field, the technology that our regulations sparked not only have made cars cleaner, which was the goal we had, but they've turned out to make cars higher quality, more durable, and more reliable. So there's been a lot of economic, that today's car, the modern car we know of today, wouldn't have come, or at least would not have come as quickly if it hadn't been for our, our regulations promoting the manufacturers to innovate. And the best example is the computer. It came onto cars in the early 80s because of our emission standards. It would've, they would have come onto cars ultimately anyway, but they came on because of our standards. And then once they were there, the engineers figured out, wow, we can do a whole lot of stuff here with our engine control and our transmission control and everything once the computer was on the car. And a lot of people don't know that positive role of regulation. So a, a little timeline, I call this the pre-Trump history because there'll be another timeline um, uh, under the Trump administration. In 2007, the Supreme Court ruled that EPA could regulate greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act. And that was a big debate because climate change, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, none of those words appear anywhere in the Clean Air Act. So it was a, it was a fierce legal debate about whether we could regulate greenhouse gas emissions or not. But, but by a five to four vote with Anthony Kennedy via the swing vote to kind of connect this to current events, uh, the court did rule that because EPA has a responsibility to protect the public health and welfare, that should EPA decide that high levels of greenhouse gas emissions endanger, that's the word in the Clean Air Act, endanger the public health and welfare, then we had an obligation to regulate once we made that determination that they did uh, pose an environmental threat. So scientists mm -hmm. at EPA made, made that decision two years later in 2009. And that led to the first big climate initiative by the Obama administration, first in 2010, to set some standards in the early years, and then in 2012 to extend those standards out to 2025. Uh, we did these greenhouse gas standards in concert with the Department of Transportation, which, which oversees the much longer standing fuel economy program, the corporate average fuel economy standards, that I'm sure all of you have heard about. And because 99.9% of the carbon and gasoline gets emitted as carbon dioxide, these two standards basically are very closely related in terms of the type of technology and the stringency of the standards. Uh, all the major automakers, this, this was an unusual regulatory process. It wasn't just EPA coming in and forcing things down the throat of the industry. We certainly have done that at times. We've had to do that at times. Um, but this was a the Obama administration wanted to have strong standards, but they wanted to have automaker buy-in. So there were literally hundreds of meetings with every major automaker, every major automotive supplier in this country, along with consumer groups, environmental groups, and it was very much a negotiated outcome. They were strong standards, and I'll show you what they were, but the, the automakers did get a lot of what they were looking for. We got California to buy in, so there wouldn't be two separate standards. Under the Clean Air Act, California is the one state that can actually set different vehicle standards than EPA because LA had always had the most severe 
pollution problems because the state of California had actually done some minimal regulation before EPA started working on vehicle pollution. The last thing the automakers want is having to make cars for two different sets of standards. That's very inefficient to them. They want to have one set of standards. And we were able to get California to buy in, and that was a big benefit to the automakers. Um, we did have a lot of public input, and I like to cite the fact that we had about 200,000 people that, that contacted EPA or came to our public hearings. 99% of those people supported these strong standards. And then the last process step before Trump was in January of 2017, in the final couple of weeks before the new administration took over, the Obama EPA did reaffirm these standards. We went, we went back and looked because these were such big standards and we had done them over a 14 year time frame. We wanted to take another look, make sure the technology had advanced to the degree that we had thought it would, make sure the cost wasn't too high, make sure people are still willing to buy the vehicles, all those kind of basic things. And we did reaffirm that we thought these standards, if anything, would be a little cheaper and a little easier to meet when we reviewed this in 2016 and 2017 than we had originally thought back in 2012. And all in all, we published about 10,000 pages on this topic over the preceding decade. It's the most massive technical record we've ever done on a regulation. And there's no question we did the most sophisticated and comprehensive automotive technology analysis ever. So something about the standards, There's a, uh, I can't go into all the nuances and details, but I always like to break it down into the stringency of the standards, which is what matters most to the climate, and then the structure of the standards, which is what matters more to the automakers. On the stringency side, it was an environmental victory. We put in what I call continuous improvement standards. Over this 14-year time frame, from 2012 to 2025, the standards get a little more stringent, 4 to 5 percent per year, each and every year. And 4 to 5% per year doesn't sound like a lot, but when you do it over 14 years, it essentially doubles the fuel economy or halves, the reduces by 50%, the CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions. So massive improvement over that long time frame. But we did try to structure the program to give the automakers things that they wanted to make this more palatable to them. We didn't mandate that people buy certain types of vehicles or that they sell certain types of vehicles. We were going to leave that up to the marketplace but the philosophy was that whatever vehicles they sell and we buy, they all, all those vehicles have to get better over time at this 4 to 5% rate. And the way that worked out was there are different standards for cars and trucks. And within the car and truck category, the standards are size based. So if you make a smaller car, you got to meet a lower CO2 target. But if you make a bigger car, you can meet a higher CO2 target and the same on the truck side. And the automakers really wanted that because they we're not trying to tell the market what to do. We're not trying to force certain vehicles into the market. Some of us maybe think we're going to do that sooner or later on climate, but, but for this standard, we don't do that. We let the marketplace play out, but we make every vehicle from the small subcompact car up to the giant pickup get better at 4 or 5% per year. We also gave credits to electric vehicles, to um, uh, ways you can reduce greenhouse gas emissions that aren't captured by our tests, like if you put a better refrigerant into an air conditioner system, that won't get captured in tailpipe emissions on a vehicle test. But if they do that, we give them credits for that and, some, and other types of off-cycle technologies. This may be, in terms of the collective economic and environmental impacts, the biggest regulation in U.S. government history. I'm trying to find an academic historian to help me figure this one out. <laughs> If you look at the 14 years, the 2012 to 2025, all the new vehicles sold in that 14 year period and let them run out to their vehicle lifetime. So some of those vehicles would still be running out in 2040 and 2050. But if you count those 14 years of, of vehicles for their lifetimes, we're going to save about 6 billion metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions and about 12 billion barrels of oil. And of course, normally we talk about million metric tons of CO2, or in, in Ann Arbor we probably talk about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of tons. But this is 6 billion metric tons nationwide of lower CO2. But there is a cost. Cars will get more expensive each year because of these standards that are 
promoting slash requiring more advanced technology. And each year, an, an average new car will get two or three hundred dollars more expensive. And over that 14 year period, if you compare the cost of a 2025 car to the cost of a 2011 car, the year before we started the new standards in 2012, collectively that 2025 car will be about $2,500 more expensive than the 2011 car. A couple hundred a year, but over that 14 year period, $2,500, we sell 17, I say we, the industry, sell 17 million new cars every year, cars and SUVs and pickups. Multiply the 17 million times the $2,500, it's $40 billion a year. So it's really a massive economic regulation as well. But the real good story is that those cars, you'll pay $40 billion more for those new cars in 2025, but those cars in 2025 will save about $100 billion over their lifetimes because they use less gasoline. So the factoid I like to cite is for every dollar that we all invest in that better technology when we buy the car, we're gonna save two or three dollars over the long run, or whoever owns our car will save two or three dollars over the long run because they have, they'll buy less gasoline. So, but these are admittedly massive economic impacts, but we think they were all on the positive side, which is why we think this is a win-win for both the environment and the economy. I won't dwell on these numbers. You know, we have thousands of pages and numbers in these um, rulemaking documents that we publish, but um, the more important numbers are in red. Most of us, even those of us working on greenhouse gases think in terms of fuel economy more often, we think in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So I, I have the gram per mile standards there before the standards started in 2016 and then what they will be in 2025. Some of you may have in your head 54.5 miles per gallon. When the rules were first established, we made the mistake of giving the White House this number, 54.5 miles per gallon, which was the stringency of the greenhouse gas standards converted into miles per gallon space. And President Obama then talked about that number, this three digit number with a decimal place in it. And uh, it, was, it was a big mistake because it didn't really relate to the fuel economy that people were gonna get in the real world because we have tests at EPA that we run that are very controlled tests indoors on a dynamometer. They don't reflect the way we all drive our cars in the real world. So they never, so the public start, gets this impression that these standards will give them a 50 mile per gallon vehicle. The automakers get scared because 50 miles per gallon sounds like a lot and it would be a lot. But the more important numbers are the red column on the right hand side. These are the estimates of what people will actually get in the real world if these standards are successfully met. We were averaging about 21 miles per gallon in 2011 before we did these standards. We're currently at about 25 or 26 miles per gallon in 2018 and it would be about 36 miles per gallon in 2025 if they meet the standards. It's not quite doubling now because cars have gotten bigger because gasoline prices have been lower than we thought. People have been buying more SUVs and crossovers and because the standards depend on the sizes of the vehicles that you buy, the industry, this number would have been 40 or 41 miles per gallon if the types of vehicles that we were buying today were the ones that we had projected they would buy back in 2011 and 2012. Now they're buying a little bit bigger fleet, so we think 36 miles per gallon will be the ultimate level. But again, 36 compared to 21 is pretty close to a doubling and still a massive environmental benefit. Last slide looking backwards, what do we know about how these standards have played out uh, in, the, in the real world so far? I think they've been a real success. We've got six years of empirical data now to look back on. They started in 2012, so we're now in our seventh year in 2018. There has been a tremendous amount of new technology, mostly gasoline vehicle technology, certainly some progress on electric vehicles, but most of the money that the industry is putting into technology is still with gasoline technology. and they've continue to find ways to improve the efficiency of this technology. I consider it a free lunch so far because consumers have saved more in gasoline fuel savings than they've had to put into the technology. Sales are booming. Uh, if you look at 2015, 2016, and 2017, the last three full years, they're three of the four best years in U.S. automotive history. Automaker profits are up, UAW jobs in the US are up. 
Automakers actually overcomplied for the first four years, meaning they actually met lower CO2 or higher fuel economy levels than the standards required. In the last two years, they've been a little bit deficient, but they were able to earn credits for those first four years and bank those credits, and some of the automakers have had to use some of those credits to comply in the last two years. The reason it's not linear is that these standards are sales weighted, so what you do with the, um, you know, an F-150 matters a lot more than what you do with the, the old Honda Insight that didn't have very big sales. So it turns out the automakers haven't redesigned very many of their high volume vehicles the last couple of years, so that's what's made it tougher. All the pickups, all the big SUVs, they'll start getting redesigned in the next year or two, and they'll be in a much better position as they bring new technology into those high sales vehicles. And we actually have a ticker on our website that no one's made us take down yet that shows the American public <laughs> how much GHG and how much gasoline savings these standards have led to. And I give the website there if anybody wants to take a gander at that. So uh, now, bring it up to today, uh, what's happened since the Trump administration took office? Well, the good news is so far, nothing of any meaningful long-term impact has happened. And that's because even the president can't come in and unilaterally change a regulatory standard that was set through a long and involved public participation process. The only way to undo that standard or weaken that standard or change it in any way is to go through that same laborious public rulemaking process. So, so far, no changes. You may recall the president came out to Willow Run here, uh, 10, 15 miles away, back in 2017, made a big speech about job-killing regulations, and that he felt that these regulations were an example of job-killing regulations, and he wanted to bring more jobs to the industry, and he wanted EPA, he was gonna order the, his EPA to take a look at these standards to see whether they needed to be changed. Um, EPA career staff, where I've worked for a long time, has basically been locked out of this process, and the lead has been given to the Department of Transportation, who have done the fuel economy standards. We had worked with them, but to be honest, we had done 90% of the work, because we had more, more engineers, more PhD engineers. We have a laboratory, they don't. We care about greenhouse gas emissions. They, they're a safety organization, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. They don't really care about certainly not about climate and not even that much about fuel economy. They've always done fuel economy as kind of a sideline. But they have the lead right now within the administration. And just a couple months ago in May, this was an important step, DOT submitted uh, a long technical document to the Office of Management and Budget which reviews all major regulations before they're proposed publicly and that package is still at OMB. We thought it would be released to the public sometime this month. Now with the uh, recent resignation of our ex-administrator Pruitt, who knows how that's gonna affect the timing. Uh, could be later this month, could be August or September, there's really no way of knowing. That's all process. On the substance side, what do we know about what's gonna be proposed? Well, you, you don't know until you know, right? Especially with this administration, but the press has apparently gotten copies of this document and it appears that the likely proposal is a six-year freeze of the standards. They would continue to get a little more, a little more stringent, four or five percent a year, till 2020. And then for the following six years, they'd be frozen at those 2020 levels. And why they're frozen all the way to 26 when our standards only went to 25, I don't know. We've been jokingly <laughs> calling it a bonus year, that the Trump administration didn't just want to freeze them for the five years, that the standards are already in place. They wanted to offer the industry a bonus year and freeze it for one more year after 2026. And certainly because EPA has not been involved, I think there was a clear decision made by, at least by Administrator Pruitt, that EPA was going to kind of rubber stamp this proposal from DOT and convert those fuel economy numbers into greenhouse gas numbers. Last point of this slide, this re represents a major, an unprecedented reversal in the technical analysis by the Department of Transportation. For the previous seven or eight years, they had agreed with us that these standards provided a net societal benefit to society, that those fuel savings I talked about were much larger than the vehicle cost increases to consumers. Apparently, based on press reports, the new analysis suggests now that the standards will be a net societal cost to society. And I'm going to be incredibly interested to review that analysis to see how did they come to that assumption after, for seven straight years, saying the exact opposite. Makes, makes me wonder. 
last couple of slides, the role of automakers. We're in southeastern Michigan. Uh, many, uh, many of our colleagues uh, work for the industry. This has been an unusual role. This has not been the typical role that I'm familiar with in my EPA career. On the one hand, they did kind of open up the Pandora's box, what I call a Pandora's box. Just a few days after President Trump was elected, in November 2016, the trade associations in D.C. that represent the major automakers sent a letter to uh, the president's transition team. This was before the president even took office, but to his transition team, asking the transition team and the president to take another look at these standards. So they did definitely kind of open up the box. Their three main arguments have been, number one, that gasoline prices are lower today and projected to stay relatively lower. They're actually obviously up a little bit the last eight, nine months now, but, but they're still lower than what we projected back when we set these standards. Gas was about $4 a gallon, and people thought it would even go higher, and now it's been in kind of the $2.50, $3 range, and that worries the automakers that people may not be willing to continue to pay that extra two or $300 a year to buy new technology if gas prices are lower. Obviously, recent events have been that gas prices have started to rise again, so I think that argument's a little bit weaker. They've been worried about electric vehicle sales remaining low. They're about 1%, give or take a little bit, of the current market. But our response to that is we never expected our standards through 2025 to, to have to drive a lot of electric vehicles. We expected that most of the improvement would come from better gasoline technology. We expected maybe 2 or 3% of the 2025 fleet to be electric vehicles. It's 1% today. Most people think it will get to 2 or 3 or 4 or 5% by 2025. So we still think we're in the ballpark on that. And I think their biggest concern, kind of pulling it all together, will consumers continue to be willing to pay a little bit more for new vehicles? I look back at that sales data, three of the four best years in history since our standards have been in place, but they worry. I guess, and they're in an industry where you're spending tremendous amounts of money and you're going to worry about those kind of things. But so far, people seem to love the fact that their new vehicles are more efficient and saving them money. So I think the automakers are trying to walk what I call a fine line here. They would like to get some relief, and I think if you really sat down with them in a confidential conversation, they would say what they meant by some relief, maybe give us an extra year or two to meet those 2025 levels, stretch, stretch out the time frame a little bit, or maybe give us more of these credits to encourage us to build more EVs and sell more EVs and maybe subsidize those EVs so that more people will buy them and build up a market. I think that's what they, most of the automakers wanted. They didn't want kind of a massive rollback because they don't want to be viewed as not being part of the climate solution, right? If they're going to be successful both in the U.S. market and in the global market in the future, they've got to be part of the climate solution. The Chinese are not going to be buying 20 and 25 and 30 mile per gallon vehicles. They're going to want 40 and 50 and 60 mile per gallon vehicles. And the automakers know that. And they know they've got to do better and better if they're going to be successful. And they don't want to be viewed as, a, you know, as climate deniers or, not, or, or dragging their feet. Or in the extreme case, they don't want to be viewed like the tobacco, tobacco companies or like the oil companies. And I truly believe that they're trying to figure out how to walk that fine line. Uh, the press reports that many automakers are very nervous about this proposed uh, rollback. They don't want separate EPA and California standards. California's already said, Jerry Brown's already said multiple times that if EPA weakens the standards, he's going to keep the strict standards in California. That'll lead to massive lawsuits about whether, he, whether California can do that or not. Um, the industry, which invests so much money every year, doesn't like uncertainty, and this is just maximum uncertainty about whether the standards would be defended in court, uh, whether a new president would come in three or four years from now and completely want to go back the other direction, so they're nervous about that as well. Lastly, my conclusions, when I, look, when I try to stand back and look at all this, I think the continuous improvement standards have been very successful for all the reasons that I said. There's this massive technical record to show that the standards make sense, and we'll all be reviewing what appears to be a different record that DOT will be putting on the, on the table in the next few weeks. Many uh, climate experts think that this is the single biggest act that any individual country has taken to reduce CO2 emissions. It was actually going to give more benefits than the Clean Power Plan, which gets a lot more attention uh, than the vehicle standards. But when you compare the numbers, this was going to lead to more CO2 benefits. And lastly, and I think the reason why I was excited to come here tonight, southeastern Michigan is an important part of this debate, right? We're, we're the center of the U.S. automotive industry, 
And we could help shape the national dialogue if more elected officials like our city council, if more automakers, if more uh, UAW, which has been a promote, proponent of these standards in the past, we'll see how they play it now. If, if, if people from southeastern Michigan stand up and say, no, we can both protect the planet on the one hand and grow the economy and keep a healthy automobile industry, that will have an influence on the national dialogue because it's coming from southeastern Michigan. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. I'd be happy to answer any questions now or hang around after the meeting if I've gone too long and, and talk to people if there's any questions. Questions from the commission? I have a question. And I, sure. I feel like I should know this, but I don't. So, uh, obviously, they're trying to roll back the car standards. For trucks, is that not So far, for our heavy-duty, um, for what we call our heavy-duty, which is large trucks and buses, so far, there's been no, except that with one exception, you guys may have read the glider issue, yeah. mm -hmm. um, which is not the core heavy duty truck standards, but it's a question of can a manufacturer uh, build a new chassis but take an old engine out of an old truck and put that old engine mm -hmm. into the new truck chassis and call that a new truck that's meeting our standards. And we, when we did the standards, we said no come on, you can't do that because people just keep using older engines forever and we're going to have a lot more pollution that way. Uh, our ex-administrator did, did want to do that. Um, uh, I didn't work on that project. So that's, that's the one example, and that's still up in the air right now. As he was resigning on Friday, you probably read uh, over the weekend, uh, he kind of gave a parting gift to the environment by telling uh, I guess they drafted up a short document in D.C. that said that for two years, while the long-term decision about the gliders gets decided, for the next two years, EPA was not going to enforce uh, against it. Mm. I'm convinced that will be sued very quickly, and I'm convinced that, that the Trump EPA will lose on that. But, that is the one, but that's the one issue that's hanging with trucks. And I think, there, I'll just say real briefly, I think the reason why there's been less there is that every heavy-duty truck and engine manufacturer also support our standard because the price of diesel fuel is such a critical part of a heavy-duty fleet that it, it's in everybody's best interest for those types of vehicles to get more efficient. I think it's in everybody's interest for cars to get more efficient, but it's a little trickier because people buy cars for all kinds of reasons. I mean, we all know some people don't really care about the fuel economy of their car. They don't think about it compared to so many other things, and it's a more complicated purchase decision, I think, on the car side. On the truck side, everybody wants more efficient trucks because it saves them money. Other questions from commissioners? I, okay. I have one, one request, and I told you that I was going to ask you to do this, and that was, um, can you change roles, turn 360 degrees, and pretend you're someone that's defending um, the suspension of the CAFE standards for five to six years. What kind of argument, just so we get at least somewhat of a balance of what viewpoints, viewpoints might be, uh, why would the Trump administration argue for a six-year freeze? Now, you've given some, some indications already, but can you maybe try to summarize that? So I'll, in so I'll, se I'll separate. I think there's the, the possible technical arguments, and then what I think is really at play. Okay. My own, but on the technical side, I'd go back to those three bullets I mentioned that um, gasoline prices are lower than we thought they would be, and so that decreases consumer demand for higher fuel economy. Uh, I don't believe that to be true myself, but that would be that would be one of my arguments. Number two, that EVs aren't selling as high as some people thought they would be. They haven't taken off. They haven't taken over the market. And number three, that look into the future. If you're conservative and nervous and worried, as vehicle prices continue to go up as they have over the last decade, do you get to some point where, even though sales have remained strong and we're at record levels? Will that keep happening or not? Or do you get to some point where people say, you know what, I was willing to pay $30,000 for that F-150, but I'm not willing to pay $40,000 for it. Uh, that's, I think, their best technical arguments. I'm going to be reading you know, this package when it becomes public with great interest, though, because I, I can't imagine what gyrations they had to go through, how many assumptions they had to change to take an analysis that for seven years said this would have net societal benefits in the hundreds of billions of dollars 
and now say it's going to have net societal costs in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So we won't know until we see it. Mm -hmm. I think really what's at play here is that, um, and so this is absolutely my opinion, and you, but um, you know, EPA publishes half of all the U.S. government's regulations. We're a big agency. We're responsible for air pollution, water pollution, you know, radiation, toxic waste dumps, and um, there are fellow citizens who hate the fact that we have an EPA that's doing these types of things because they think that we're wasting taxpayer money and, and uh, you know, reducing jobs and, and all that stuff. We, you know, when, when um, Steve Bannon said that his job was to deconstruct the administrative state, he was saying that to EPA more than anybody else in the government because we, to them, we are the administrative state because of all the regulations we do. And I think it's an ideological uh, driven position. Um, now, I may be wrong, we may, maybe they'll make a tremendous case in these documents are going to come out. And I just hope that there's a, I want it to be a data driven decision. If it's that way, I think we're going to win. Um, but I think those are the best arguments they have. Thank you. Good presentation, uh, very informative. Thank I'll you very much. Later. Maybe else has any other questions. Moving right along here, we have before us a draft resolution in support of the existing EPA passenger car cafe standards. Can I introduce it? Yes, maybe just a few words uh, in terms of the background. Uh, I attended a climate reality project meeting together with Jeff. Um, Jeff presented a modified version or an earlier version of this presentation at that meeting. And um, we were talking about what we might be able to do um, in terms of letter writing or other kinds of things to be able to influence decision makers. And um, one of the things that we came up with was the idea of presenting this here at the Energy Commission. Um, obviously, the fact that, uh, as Jeff mentioned, the automotive industry, um, even um, the foreign um, automotive industry is largely based, at least in terms of their engineering activities here in southeastern Michigan. Um, there's obviously um, economic impact here. We also have the EPA uh, federal lab here in Ann Arbor, and so we thought that that was another connection. And then, of course, we have our climate action plan targets. And so um, looking at that, we thought this was relevant for the Energy Commission, and that's how we ended up here today, and that's how we ended up with the resolution in front of us. Um, everybody has a copy of it, I believe. It was sent out um, a day or two ago. Um, also, an earlier version was sent out, and there were some good comments, which led to a few changes in the text. Um, and the primary change is actually, I don't know that we've done this before, at least um, with our resolutions, but on the back side of the page, um, there are footnotes um, that provide uh, information on where uh, some of the facts and figures in the resolution draft um, come from. So um, what we attempted to do, Jeff and I worked back and forth on these, was to actually try to find um, sources of information in the public domain that anybody can go to, whether it's anybody on, in this group or in city council or anyone else looking at this and saying, where, where does this come from? Show me the facts, so to speak. So we're trying to be as uh, transparent and factual as we can be. So um, I guess uh, I could read it. I don't know if that's necessary. Um, I do have one uh, comment, or two comments, actually. And that is, I guess, um, both in the title as well as in the first whereas statement where CAFE is uh, stated that I should probably spell that out. Yes. Um, so I'll do that. So that would be the corporate average fleet, um, um, econ or, um, fleet economy standards, right? Could I make a friendly? Yes, what is it again? Um, since DOT sets the CAFE standards yes. and EPA sets the greenhouse gas, it might be better to say the EPA greenhouse gas emission. Or you could say greenhouse gas slash CAFE. We do that a lot too, but we probably need to get greenhouse gas into the title. Okay, greenhouse gas. I'm sorry, I missed that. Yep. And CAFE is Corporate Average Fleet 
fuel, um, fuel, oh, fuel economy, excuse me, right, fuel economy. So um, that doesn't change really the substance of it, but we should um, do that, I think. We'll, so we'll add greenhouse gas in the title as well as in other places where we talk about CAFE standards. Um, and then at, henceforth, we just use the word standard, so we don't have to change, change it after that. But in the title in the first place, then the whereas. Um, the other thing maybe I thought we should change, um, and that is at the very last resolve, it says Michigan-based automotive original equipment manufacturers. Um, that really is only two. That's officially just Ford and GM. Um, but I think maybe what we want to say um, is automotive original equipment manufacturers with operations in Michigan. And that would then be, of course, Toyota and Hyundai and basically all the other OEMs, um, whether they're JOEMs or European OEMs that have operations here. So I, I propose that we change Michigan-based automotive original equipment manufacturers to automotive original equipment manufacturers with operations in the state of Michigan. There's a typo on footnote number two. Uh -huh. It should say 2017 and 2025. 25, yes, thanks. Um, the other suggestion is, if, I mean, if we're, if we're saying communicating to sort of the decision makers plus the um, some of the major stakeholders who are involved, uh, you might also want to include the UAW on here if they aren't. <clears throat> what do other people think, or Jeff, what do you think, or that we add at the bottom that we also indicate um, that Ann Arbor basically communicated support not only to members of Congress, the OEMs, EPA, et cetera, but also the UAW? I, I think that would be great. Uh -huh. That would mm -hmm. be great. Okay. I think one other thing we're hoping potentially is that other municipalities, not only in Michigan, but potentially elsewhere in the country, pick this up and then also come in and step in and support the uh, current the current greenhouse gas and cafe standards. I just had a suggestion in the resolved part. Um, I know there's no proposed rule at this point. Is that correct? Do, by the way, do, I, I, I may have been out of line here. Do we need a motion we to do consider need this motion. before we start talking about yes, all the changes? Yes, we should. We should. So, sorry. Oh, <laughs> no problem. I, I'm just thinking when there is a proposed rule, it would be good to have some official thing that goes on the record um, as a public comment coming from the city, if possible, in addition to just all this informal stuff that we also want to do. Uh, so when, you know, as part of the rulemaking process, there'll, there'll be a proposed rule and then mm -hmm. you'll be allowed to submit Com comments, uh -huh. something officially from the city of Ann Arbor uh -huh. that sure. would go on the record, I think would be useful. So then possibly a second resolve clause um, directing, say, the city attorney to, to um, enter a comment on behalf of the city when... Yeah, I'm not sure who would be best to write that. I mean, with our consultation, I guess, potentially, or? Should we wait to do that until we see the rules, or? I mean, we certainly can't. Yeah. We have an idea, I think, of what we'd want to say, but. What was the motivation to pass this now instead of once the proposal was released? Uh, we actually didn't talk about waiting. We just. Uh, a good question. I was thinking about that just a few minutes ago, too. Is there a reason, um, Jeff, why we'd want to pass this now as opposed to waiting on the actual proposed new standard? I think that's, um, I think that's a legitimate question. Uh, the, the possibility of also submitting comments once the proposal's out. Right. So, I think that's probably really up to you guys in council. I think it's, it's helpful either time. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with this type of thing, you never know what's going to have any meaningful <laughs> impact, right? Um, but um, I would say the, the, go ahead and pass it now, and and when the new ruling comes out, we can review it and decide whether or not we want to pass something else. Well, and you expected the rule to come out already, right? So it probably will be soon. We, I mean, we just don't knows? know, right? Yeah. It, it could be in a couple weeks, it could be in a couple months, we just don't know. Yeah. Hmm. This is such a difficult administration to predict. 
I worry that release passing it now makes it look like we are just opposing it to oppose it instead of waiting to oppose the substance. Yeah. And it would it's more valuable to include critical analysis of the proposal, exact proposal with a the one the one thing I would say, I mean I think I can definitely see that. The one thing I would say though is that the the resolution as it's written now is essentially saying supporting the current standard. Yeah. So yeah. it it doesn't we're not, we're not making a determination on what the new ones will look like. That's all you can really do now is support the current yeah. standards if we don't know what the proposed standards are yet. Yeah. We, we don't expect them to be more stringent, though. <laughs> we know that. <laughs> if only. Do we have a motion to introduce these, or <coughs> and then we can discuss them and then second and then and then take a vote of that? Or how do we want to do this? Usually the, the so writer I, okay. proposes, but. So I, I, I motion that we consider uh, this resolution. Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion. Pass it now or wait? Which we've been discussing. <laughs> <laughs> no matter when the rule is proposed, there will still be a public comment period, right? Yeah. OK. I think that would be the right time to pass this, but I see that it is valuable. Just seems like a timing question to me. The, the other, I'm not sure what the timeline would be on the comment period. We traditionally do not have a meeting in August, although we could have one, uh, which would put it into September before we could do anything. I have a question of Council Member Eaton. Do you think that City Council would take this up? Or do you think they would want to wait before, or until I should say, the standard came out and we were actually taking a position in support of the current standards and against known published new proposed standards? I actually don't know. And um, I, I mean, the resolve clause, um, asks us to support current standard. So it, it, as written, it doesn't really require. On the other hand, um, I think the more important action would be to uh, enter a comment during the comment period. Should, you know, the standards be, or changes be proposed to the standard. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, we could bring another resolution later, I suppose. Um, so, I, I, I don't see a lot of resistance to this. Mm -hmm. um, it's just expressing a preference. It's now. I guess we could add a resolve clause that says if public comment is to open, Ann Arbor would, should support, should submit comments in support of the current rules. We could do that or it we could just wait. continues to not uh, allude, not address whatever actual right. proposal there. I, I don't think that you're facing any harm if you wait, but I don't, I don't think that you're going to face any hesitancy on the part of council if you don't. So it's really up to you as to how you want to proceed. Public comment periods are typically 90, 90, days. 90 days, right? Right, so 90 days, Jeff. Is that what public comment periods typically are? For something this important, it would normally be 90 or even 120, but we've heard it might only be 60 days this time around. We, it's, again, unpredictable. There's uncertainty minutes. about that. There'll be <laughs> somewhere in the 60 to 120 day range. Thank you. 60 could be problematic if it comes out very soon, and we would have to consider this in September, and then it would have to go right away to council. Um, and then not only that, but then if we want an official comment to be submitted, then that would have to be written and submitted all within a 90 or a six, potentially 60 to 120 day period. That, that's, it, that's, that's maybe one mm -hmm. downside to waiting. I, I don't have a problem with waiting, but that could be one, one reason not to. Can I recommend that we pass this tonight to keep it in our pocket, so to say, but not act on trying to get it to be brought to council's attention unless the proposal is made official? And then if that doesn't happen, 
uh, like if it's made official in August and we think timing's an issue. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't come out till September, then we can pass an updated resolution. Well, and I would say too, I mean, I think if we're concerned about timing and in particular concerned about comments and drafting comments and getting that in, I think we should add the res a second resolved section here to go ahead and have it all taken care of in one thing. And you'd like to do that tonight? I mean, or I, I think it makes sense if we're gonna if we're gonna take action on this, then we should, you know, I think do the whole thing and not sort of come back and have to do a second. So if we want to do that, then we have to have the exact language right now. You want I mean, to I think I thought your language that you. I mean, we don't know. So is it the city attorney that? I, I, I would actually ask staff who would be the appropriate person, but I, I assume it's the city attorney. What this resolution does is it asks for council action, mm -hmm. and so actually that council action would be a, a separate resolution. That's that, true. We could modify mm -hmm. this between and so now and then. If, if staff worked with the um, yes. city yeah. attorney's office to draft that resolution, right. it, it could include that that language. clause. Yeah. You know? Okay. Let's Great. do that. I like that idea. Yeah. Yeah. And if we have to do it with the attorney's office, we better pass this tonight, I think. <laughs> just to keep things moving along. Right. <laughs> Any, any other comments? Mr. Chair, are you implying something? <laughs> no, good heavens, no. <laughs> Maybe just one other point of, of uh, I can't say fact, um, extrapolation, if you will, the, the, in sort of in the middle of the resolution, there are, there's a whereas statement that talks about rising CO2 emissions from the transportation sector. Um, I won't have this exactly off. Yeah. Did you? Oh, sorry. Okay. I, I don't have this exactly off the top of my head. Josh, you might be able to help me. But we, we did um, a rough estimate of our 2050 emissions. And what we did in estimating those is took any current CAFE standards or ones that were proposed and extrapolated those out and then also looked at what we knew from utilities and things like that in terms of what they were going to do in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. DTE, mm -hmm. for example, has, had made announcements. And what we saw in 2050 is, these are gonna be very rough numbers, um, but um, I don't remember, I think it was, um, what was the units, it was 200,000 metric tons, roughly, it was a little, bit, a little bit less than that, metric CO, metric tons of uh, CO2 equivalents in 2050 was the target, and we were going to be somewhere over 600,000, so we were going to miss by a, roughly a factor of three, and transportation emissions were going to rise to 47% of the total. So you have the figures in front of you for 2015. And I only say there is those very rough figures, just to give you an idea why transportation sector emissions are so important. Now, that doesn't mean that this freeze couldn't then be offset by very, very aggressive targets that, were, that would come into play in 2030 to 2050. We don't know what's going to happen. But I just wanted to say that knowing what we sort of know today, transportation emissions become a bigger and bigger factor in Ann Arbor's greenhouse gas inventory and our profile. Some of you probably know that transportation is now overtaking utilities nationally for greenhouse gas emissions, which is the first time that's ever happened. Thanks. Any other comments? Bridget, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, I have a comment about a different whereas, but while we're on this whereas, because I think we're talking about the one that um, ends with the equivalent of two to three dollars per one dollar in technology cost. Do you mean additional vehicle cost? I mean, is that what that technology means? Yeah. It might be good to say additional vehicle cost. Okay. Just because that makes yep. it more clear. Yeah. Um, however, it's the whereas before that, I find the wording just a little confusing because I think what it's trying to say is that the UAW and essentially most major automakers 
supported the original cafe introduction, um, but I found the way it's worded a little awkward. Well, if you leave out the, and, the clause, except for Daimler and uh, Volkswagen and Daimler, then it reads, whereas current EP, uh, EPA car, and we'll change to greenhouse gas slash cafe standards, were implemented in two th 2012, and all major automakers plus the UAW mm -hmm. supported their introduction. Right. And then accept as a yeah. parenthetic S or a, a comma. So I have a friendly amendment if you want to keep the accept for Volkswagen and Daimler is to change it to were implemented in 2012 mm -hmm. and the UAW and all mm -hmm. UAW and all major automakers except Volkswagen and Daimler supported their introduction. So you put the Just, UAW okay. um, after 2012 and take it out of that plus the United Auto Workers. Okay, that's fine. I think it, it reads a little bit better that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it would read, whereas the current EPA Passenger car, greenhouse gas slash cafe standards, henceforth standards, were implemented in 2012, and the UAW and all major automakers, except for Volkswagen and Daimler, supported their introduction. Yeah. Okay. Got that, Josh? Yep. Great. Any other comments, questions, remarks? If not, Let's bring this to a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Moving right along. We have another resolution here that was drafted by myself and added on with a few other people, including John. <clears throat> and just as background, um, it's become um, apparent to us or we've been told that uh, Nate's position is not going to be filled for potentially a year or more um, because they decided to move the money elsewhere apparently and this is kind of a step backwards we thought we were getting a step forward when we made Emily and Josh's positions full-time and um, this takes us back a step right at the time that we're looking at potentially having uh, an $800,000 program that yet has yet to be finalized um, so the basic gist of this is that we're requesting that they move forward with filling that vacancy so um, I propose a motion to um, Pose this resolution. I pass this resolution. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Discussion. Just a small thing. Yeah. You, you're inconsistent in the way that you express fiscal years. A fiscal year is from July 1st to J June 30th of the next year. So we're mm -hmm. currently in the 2019 fiscal year. It's not 2018 slash 19. Oh, okay. Okay. So 2020 slash 2021 becomes 21, right? And 1819 becomes 19. Well, it should probably be expressed as the full year, so 2019. Yes. And the previous one. Tw 2020. And 2019. So we have here, here, yeah, and okay. there. Yeah, right, right, yep. Um. And so that's it. Well, this should actually be fiscal year 20. This 2020, not 20, or yeah. not 19. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 20, 2020. 
20, no, in order for them to start in fiscal year 2019. Is the last sentence a comment? No, start in 20. No. Um, yeah, that's a comment, the okay. very last sentence. So just exit out? Yep. <laughs> Let's see. Whereas these climate action programs need to be designed immediately in order for them to start in fiscal year 19 and then ramp up significantly in fiscal year 2020 slash 2021. The, the reason um, I put in here 2019 is we have $75,000 in fiscal year 19 for climate action work. And that can be spent, as I understand it, for consultants or um, other people to help us develop the programs, mm -hmm. but it potentially can also be spent to pilot some of the programs. Josh, for example, talked about the Michigan Saves program, mm -hmm. which is for energy efficiency and solar energy. It might be that of that 75,000, we I'm just stating a possibility that 25,000 of that might actually be for a pilot program. So that's why I had recommend to Wayne that this whereas statement needs to be designed immediately in order for them to start in fiscal year 2019. So it should be expressed as fiscal year fiscal 2019, 2019 rather, than, rather than just 19. Correct, 2019. And then that second reference, are you referring to two, the, the subsequent two years? Correct. So it should say fiscal year 2020 slash and, 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 and 2021. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. And then the next whereas clause. And would, also as well. You, okay. And we should probably put FY so we're mm -hmm. consistent just in the usage. Everywhere else we're using FY. Mm -hmm. uh, so just so I'm further understanding. So there is, so there was this position, staff resigned. There is continued funding for the position, but we've been given to hear that they're not hiring for this position, they're gonna hire for something else, is that? The budget that we adopted as council um, that started July 1st had three FTEs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they haven't filled the, the empty space created by his resignation. And somebody's indicated that they don't intend to, so. Okay. So I, I, I'm reluctant to be explicit. I think most people know that I have this role where I am supposedly a sustainability advisor to the city administrator. I met with him last Friday and he told me that as Wayne, he was a little more specific with me, but I don't necessarily want to pass it here to everybody, is that the intention is not to hire Nate's replacement or the, a, new, a replacement energy analyst to take a person's name out of this, because there was a gap um, that was in another area of the city budget, and the money slash FTE position was needed in that other area. So basically what we're saying here is not knowing all the details of that, and we probably won't, Council May, together with input from the administrator, um, is we are saying we see a need here to hire an energy analyst because, um, with all due respect to Josh, you know, Nate um, was someone that was in this position for many years. He had a big network. He had background in all this different work that was being done. And then we also had this big ramp up in developing programs and plans and launching those. And in order to do that efficiently and effectively, we think we need someone to be able to plan that. If we don't plan it well, um, if we get the money or a portion of the money, then we see that there's a risk of not executing those programs well, and that is something that we don't want to, to happen. We want to spend the city's money wisely. Yeah, it's just, it's a little difficult to, I mean, I, I think this is very carefully worded in that, you know, it's clearly just saying we support them hiring for this position and we feel this position is um, important, which I agree with. I uh, agree with your analysis that I think um, they need some expertise in order to get to the goals that we've set. 
Um, but it's difficult to um, judge the merits or the impacts when I don't know what the full decision is. Like, what is the other position that they don't have that, I mean, I think there's some cost benefit here that's, mm -hmm. if I don't fully understand what the full picture is in terms of staff hiring and what the needs are of the city as a whole, it's difficult for me to feel comfortable weighing in. Not that I don't think that this is worded in a way that I would support it or worded, um, uh, um, in a way that is specific to the position, but I do think that that's just one area of concern. I, I agree fully, and you know, as we've had discussions in this group before about whether we see the whole picture or not, you know, we're never going to see the whole picture. That's ultimately up to council and the city administrator, and I think basically what we're asking here is that council push the city administrator to replace or to fill the energy analyst position and for there to be a good give and take or push and push back between council and the city administrator. Council can mm -hmm. elect not to do this. Council can just table this. Um, but what we're saying is from what we know, um, we see a strong argument for replacing them. And is there latitude in the city budget to delay another position or to do something else mm -hmm. to be able to fill this position. And that's something that they have to do. Got I mean, it. that's what happens to executives all the time. People come up and say, um, we have this need. You know the full picture. Um, we recommend that you do X because these are the consequences if you don't do X. And then the person that is the ultimate decision maker has to look at the full let's say business proposition and then make a decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean I think I think if it's again to express support for the position being filled and to start the conversation between council and the administrator on this vacancy, I think that that is something I can get behind. Do you want to add to that? No, I I might ask our council member whether this kind of a change would normally be done without council approval? It depends. <laughs> I have a they taught, on they taught me that in law school. <laughs> <laughs> I have a tack on question, which is, are you hearing this for the first time because of this, yes. us bringing it up? Yes, I, this is the first time. So I would say I don't have enough information. Okay. Um, but council passed a budget that mm -hmm. had three FTEs mm -hmm. in the sustainability office. Yeah. And so if the administrator is hiring that third position still within the realm of sustainability but not this type of person, that's probably within his discretion to do. Mm -hmm. Although we could still push back. On the other hand, if he's using an FTE from the sustainability office um, for a purpose not broadly related to that task, I, I would think that that um, kind of offends the budget that we passed. Okay. Well, let me just <laughs> play catch ball with, with uh, um, Councilman Eaton. Um, those three FTE positions could be, and most likely actually are, Matt Nod, Emily Drennan, and Josh McDonald. I find it odd, though, that it plus then the, the new head of the department. So th the department head plus three FTEs. What I find odd is that uh, the budget would have been proposed that way because Nate did not turn in his uh, resignation until middle or the second week, something like that, of April. So. Uh, it, the budget was passed in early May, correct? Second meeting in May. Second meeting in May. So that means someone could have made a determination between Nate's resignation and the second meeting in May to pull back that position from the Office of Sustainability and Innovation. 
So would you like to postpone this and, and let us explore with the city administrator um, what his reaction is to mm -hmm. just to the fact that you're pondering this, this resolution? Mm -hmm. And they did, they posted for a job after an eight. No, they didn't. They hired, they, they, hired, they hired the department head, but that process had already been posted and the offer extended around the same time. Okay. It seems the value in this resolution is to raise noise, and it sounds like we've started that process. So at this point, whether or not we pass it is almost a bonus to the fact that we've started conversations about that yeah. this is a problem. Well, I've, I've already raised the issue. I've, yeah. I raised the issue already immediately in April for exactly these same reasons mm -hmm. in one-on-one -on -one emails with the administrator um, and in one-on-one -on -one conversations with him. Um, at that time, he wasn't committal one way or the other. Um, and as I said on Friday, he indicated that there was this other gap or budget need and that that had to be filled. Um, so the concern, I guess, that I have is I don't know the details of that. I don't know if council know, knew the details of any of that. Um, but what to me didn't make sense is that we had an office um, with basically four headcount, two seasonal employees plus two full-time employees. Um, we. I have now made the two seasonals full time, so we get a, maybe a 20% increase in their capacity. Um, and we've su substituted a department head for essentially the energy analyst. So we have effectively a very, very small increase in the total capacity and capability within that department. If you take you know, the, the, certain, the total number of hours, maybe it's a, an increase of 10 or 15%. And if we really want to do a good job with the programs for the Climate Action Plan, as well as, I might add, it's, it states um, in here that um, there's a resolution that um, the city will become 100% clean and renewable by 2035, and the city administration is required to report to this body, as well as the Environmental Commission and Council, what the plan is, what the multi-year plan is to be able to meet that target. And there's very little resources to be able to do that. Well, there's, there's kind of two things. One is, I wonder what would have happened if Nate had not resigned, would be the other question about how this staffing was, was going to go. Um, and I would assume that we would have had Nate's position and we would have had a director over, over and above the people that we're talking about. And, and we really are down a person than we expected. And I guess my feeling is that there's a certain amount of urgency involved with this. If we wait, you know, I mean, first of all, I, th I think this is the legitimate way to to raise an issue is to send a resolution to council um, and to not do it until September I think would we would lose two months so um, if I can back uh, Wayne up in that regard um, when the Ann Arbor Climate Partnership with people from the Energy Commission and the Environmental Commission made a proposal for increased climate action spending in fiscal year 18. Um, we made that proposal in December, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And we were told that that was really already too late, um, that that input needed to be provided in September already. So that that could start to be built in from the bottom up so that when council meets in December for its retreat and really starts to look at the budget, that there is a concrete proposal um, for climate action with relatively detailed programs um, that is submitted, let's say, in the fall of the budget year. And this is a two-year budget year. This is a budget year that's going to set the budget for 20 and 2020 and 2021. So if we don't get this in front of council 
and in front of the administrator until September, and then let's say somebody makes a, there's a, a positive outcome, and then the city posts for the job, well, we may get this person January, January who, who knows when, so it's too late. And I think that's the argument that you're making, yeah, is that yes. we, we can't afford to wait because the fate is sealed uh, as in terms of really developing strong climate action program proposals. Thank you. Other comments? Yes. I agree that we shouldn't wait. I mean, it seems as though um, informal conversations have been happening for a few mm -hmm. months now, and they aren't. Doesn't they don't sound like they're going anywhere? Um, and uh, there's been a significant history of <laughs> disappearing FTE in the energy office, and this just seems to be a continuation of that. So I think that we should act immediately. And I think I heard that somewhere along the line, somebody had put forth an argument that the sustainability director, I can't remember her full title, it's complicated, but essentially this- Sustainability business manager. Thank you. Uh, that this new person, I mean, she's she's got more than a full-time job without Nate's responsibilities. It's mm -hmm. pretty much insane to think that that person with those responsibilities, including solid waste, as I understand it, would also take on what was Nate's full-time, more than full-time job. Well, if I could, I, I think we can say, Josh, we've spoken with Josh, and Josh has told us that he's taken on much of Nate's job responsibilities, even though it doesn't really overlap with his job description and job responsibilities because we don't have an energy an analyst. And because we don't have someone with Nate's experience and background and we don't have that capacity, then other things are not getting done. We're not doing the kind of program development we'd like to do, but there's other things that um, affect our, our Josh's responsibilities that also aren't getting done or as well as they could be. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I think, um it is a, it's a little bit of a complicated situation. I think one thing that was brought up was uh, waste management as well, um, which is kind of something that still has to be ironed out. Um, I mean, I think as, as far as the energy side goes, uh, I kind of learned enough from Nate where I'm, I've been trying to balance that side. But as far as waste management, and if that does actually fall into our department, we don't really have anyone currently that would fill that position. And personally, that that is, I think, a big concern, at least for myself. But Just to clarify, yeah. I said solid waste. Waste yes. management is the name of a company, and I did not <laughs> intend to refer to waste management. Okay, yeah. So, <laughs> right. But someone to basically deal with that, that section of the sector. So that, that is kind of my, my own personal. And, and Missy is coming on for everyone here uh, on Monday. So she'll be onboarded, and then hopefully, you know, I, I've had uh, some conversations with her, and she said that these are things that she'll definitely address. Um, but there are concerns that, of course, going forward, we, we still have. Not to get off on too much of a tangent, but there are FTEs in other um, reporting structures that are already doing solid waste work. And I'm not saying this is the plan or this is going to happen, but it could be that those people are transferred to do to take over or to, to bring those tasks with them. And it's 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 two people plus fractions of other people. So the solid waste issue is I think we should treat separately from this. Can I Yes. yes. Sorry. Can I clarify my comments? So even if this new sustainability office, this head of this office isn't performing the solid waste jobs. She's overseeing them as well as energy, as well as a number of other things, I believe. So again, my point is mainly that she already has a full-time job without taking any of the responsibility of the ener any energy analyst position. That, that is correct. The, 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 in the presentation 
that Administrator Lazarus presented to Council in a work session on sustainability and a few other topics. He showed the new department and the areas of responsibility, um, and it included solid waste. Now, what headcount then go with that? Um, but I think your point is is that that at least um, the new sustainability business manager will have some responsibilities for solid waste and oversight of that, and that in of itself is a big plate that she will have to have to handle. Jack. So I just pulled up the, the approved budget, and there's four FTEs in the area called um, Sustainability and Innovations. Yeah. But that oversees climate action, hazardous substance remediation, yep. clean and renewable energy, neighborhood partnering, resource recovery, and innovation incubators. So that may include people that we, we are just not conceiving of. Yeah. Well, I assume the fourth person is the department head, and then the other three that you were talking about earlier. And those are different names for some of the same things. So resource management is basically solid waste, as I understand it. So that's basically um, recycling, composting, and solid waste. Um, community engagement, was it? Is that what it was called? Partnership. For partnership. That the intention there is to administer the uh, so-called uh, Sustaining Ann Arbor Green Grants, Neighborhood Green Grants Program, as well as potentially expand um, volunteer recruitment and engagement activities. Um, and then it's, you know, the energy, it's the, um, the stuff, the environmental stuff that Matt Nott is doing that you mentioned. So then, so then in, the, in the whereas, uh, second to the last, um, energy and climate action staff was increased in fiscal year da, 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 to going to one to two to three. Um, is that accurate to say that they're energy and climate action staff? It sounds like the FTEs that were approved were. This was under the old structure. So and this, this, was, this does not include the department yet. Okay. So this was. This was not in line with the creation of the new sustainability office. Was when these was, FTEs were right. It was. It was during this year. Okay. Or at last year. <laughs> last fiscal year. Okay. Bef before June thirtieth. Gotcha. Any other questions or comments? If not, I'd like to bring this to a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Passed unanimously. Moving right along. Community updates. Uh, climate action plan. I don't think we have anything really on that. Um, other than to say I've um, sent a note to Chuck Hookham, who's Commissioner Hookham's not here today, um, because there's supposed to be a climate action subcommittee um, and in reality, there is, as far as I know, there is no subcommittee because it's never met. Yeah. And <laughs> correct. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say I thought there was supposed we were supposed and, to be doing some work and there's, on it. There's a parallel activity that's going on um, with the climate, uh, the Ann Arbor Climate Partnership, and what Josh is doing, where there are these three programs that we're working on, which is energy efficiency, electrification of mobility, or charge up Ann Arbor and solar. Those are the three programs that we're really focusing on. And what we need to do is merge the two of those, but if the one committee is in name only, mm -hmm. where people have full-time jobs and they have a, you know time to do get together once in a blue moon, in reality there are no two groups. It's just the one activity. So in my view, the climate action plan activity is really the one that is being led by Josh with input from um, largely Wayne, me, and Mark with um, then feedback and updates provided through the Ann Arbor Climate Partnership that then feeds back and informs um, Josh as far as what he's doing. So I just, um, as somebody who had expressed interest in working on this and then was waiting for emails to pull people together and never received any of them, um, I think it would be helpful to involve more commissioners that were actually interested in this if it's mm -hmm. going to be 
done through a different process. We will do okay. so. Yeah. Great. And Great. then the other question I had too is that there's this note about the um, uh, the city is supposed to provide a multi-year action plan to the council through the Energy and Environmental Commissions no later than September 2018. Um, and I'm assuming that is what is being pulled together through these informal. Those are separate. Okay. So, Josh, you want to comment on that? Yeah, um, specifically as far as what do you tell us about it? Well, I mean, who's developing it? How's it? If it's being run, then through the Energy Environment Commission, September 2018 is coming up pretty quick here. So, I think it would be helpful to better understand how that's being developed and when and how we're to provide input into that. Yeah, John, I'm not sure. Do we want to create a, a method to? I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why we need a replacement for, for Nate, is that that's one of the balls that's, yeah. that's being dropped. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's the community-facing, community-wide cl you know, climate action targets, mm -hmm. but then there's another target, which is reducing the greenhouse gases from municipal operations. And Josh is uh, working on that. For example, he talked about the Honeywell audit mm -hmm. um, and getting then hopefully some action plans out of that. Then there's the Green Fleets policy. There's a whole number of things that the city needs to develop action plans on to implement mm -hmm. to start making progress towards its municipal only goal. Mm -hmm. So there's two sets of programs. Josh is dabbling in both of them, but he's stretched very thin because we're resource constrained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I should also say, um, as far as 100% renewables goes, um, uh, we've been taking a look at uh, both the Honeywell audit uh, as well as internal data that we have uh, for certain energy efficiency assets in all our buildings uh, and trying to make uh, estimates as far as what kind of energy efficiency upgrades we could do uh, internally as well as you know what kind of renewable sources could we rely on. Uh, one avenue we've been exploring a little bit uh, and I brought up here is a landfill. Um, there are some hurdles to that. Uh, but I think really laying out in that 100% uh, you know, plan some options that we have, so some different ways of getting at this, um, that, that's kind of the, the goal. And, and the more help and input that we could get from the Energy Commission, I think it would be, yeah, the, the better we're off. So. so has the Environmental Commission had any discussions about the 2035 plan? They have not. The, they typically don't have anything to do with um, greenhouse gas related activities. Right. So I'm, I'm referring to the same language that she is, yeah. the second whereas clause in that previous resolution where it directs the two commissions to um, mm -hmm. come up with a multi-year action plan by September of this year and we don't have an August meeting. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering how that will happen. It won't. I don't think. I mean, Josh can throw something together, yeah, but it, yeah, it can't be is, just. This is where we, yeah, so again, looking at the Honeywell audits, looking at internal data on the energy efficiency side, um, we've also been in, in talks or at least considered uh, DTE as another option, uh, doing kind of a green currents uh, as laying that out, um, as well as possibly something like the landfill. Um, so I think that's kind of roughly what it looks like now. I've been mostly spending my time on the energy efficiency side, so looking at those Honeywell mm -hmm. audits, um, and then doing some estimates as far as uh, DTE's predictions. So uh, how uh, you know, greening of their grids basically going to influence the, uh, the targets that we have internally. Um, but yeah, it's something that definitely still has to be fleshed out. And like I said, any kind of input that we could get and help would be very helpful. So I didn't mean that confrontationally. But I think this is really the best argument for the previous resolution is that mm -hmm. council is directed um, that something happen and the administrator is not staffing Probably. appropriately to ha have it happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's why we have it in the whereas. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. it's, but it, I don't think it's in the. It's in the second whereas clause. Right. But if the, oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah. I was reading yeah. the wrong thing. So there's, there's the first one relates to the Climate Action Plan and developing programs for it. Um, and then the second relates to the, the second set of targets that 
that council adopted, which is for municipal operations only? Well, if it would help, and only if it would help, uh, we could potentially have a little subcommittee meeting with you yeah. to brainstorm things or look at some of the things yeah. that you have helpful. done. And um, those members of the commission that are interested, and um, we could try and work around their schedules and yeah. get Chuck in the room. That might be helpful because yeah. he's pretty good at looking at those things. Uh, I'm certainly willing to look at things. So why don't we try and schedule that yeah, sure. perhaps sometime I, after the 13th of yeah. August? I think that makes a lot of sense. I also would say that if, if, if we can't get a decent thing together by September of 2018, then, I mean, it seems like this was date was written into a city council resolution. That was cut and pasted from the resolution. Yeah, so yes. it sounds like there needs to be a conversation then had with council yes. to potentially set a new deadline. Um, right. Because it's, otherwise, if you just skip a deadline and then it's just skipped, I think it, you lose some of good the... Point. Yeah. By the way, one of the reasons I, I had a significant hand in drafting this resolution, and one of the reasons for the September date yeah. is what I mentioned before, is to start to have these programs flowing in to the budget planning process. Yes. So there's a whole series of climate action related activities. Some are community facing related to the cap. Some are municipal only, municipal operations only, which relate to the second resolution that was um, adopted by council. And those have to come together with details about the programs, what is it going to take to achieve those? And that needs to flow into the budget budgeting process. So that's why all of these things link together. And the, the further and further behind that we get, um, and frankly, if we don't do a good job with these things, I would understand why council would say these are half-baked proposals. We're not going to put them in the budget. And that's something we don't want. So I'm assuming that the city administrators mention of, of hiring a consultant to, to start to develop a plan actually is in the anticipation of plugging it into a, the coming budget. We can hope. <laughs> yes, and I, and I think in that I talked to them about that and I told them likely this part of the $75,000 would be needed to do that, but then you know that's just another activity. We have to write a, pro, an, a request for proposal. That proposal has to go out to Tom, Dick, and Harry that has to come back, that has to be um, developed, and then Tom is picked and then he starts to work with Josh and us to develop programs, and by the time we've hired Tom to do this and the contract has been approved by council because it's probably gonna be more than, or around the $25,000 threshold, then we're now already into who knows what, October, November. So the fact that Nate left and that he hasn't been replaced, the consequences are snowballing. And I think it's important to realize that part of the problem that we have with getting this done in September right now is that it was somewhat reliant on the Honeywell report, which was, shall we say, less than optimal uh, when it came in. And so we have basically, how many months ago was it that we met with you and, and looked at it? Two yeah, months ago? And they're still, and, to, get and they're to, still to get back to it. So. Um, that's part of the problem that we have, um, and that's sort of beyond our control to some degree. But and, and at some point in time, you just sort of say, "Well, let's do it ourselves and get it done." Um, so, um, and I I don't know whether it would be good to have a conversation with the new director, maybe a week after she comes in, so she has a little time to catch her breath about how to best get this done and. You know, there are some members of our commission that have some expertise that can be helpful in, in getting some st stuff together for fall. So, um. so are we aware of any other deadlines that we've set for ourselves, like like September of 2018, that um, we want to look forward towards to uh, try to meet? Um, <clears throat> Well, I, I mean, certainly, I mean, it, 
from my standpoint, I wish we had a, a somewhat more developed plan for using the millage fund mm -hmm. by then, so that so that it fell right into the budget and everyone was aware of it, and it wasn't something that we were trying to push through at the last minute with the budget. But, but as far as deadlines, I just mean any council resolutions or any resolutions oh, here. Hard deadlines? That, no. That's the only one. That I'm aware of as well. Yeah. Josh, are you or anybody else aware of one? I think that's the only hard deadline. Okay, I think we've, um, solar for all, we kind of talked about the project that we're working on with Michigan Saves. What, what, just to add to that real briefly, um, I chair the the community solar subcommittee and we haven't been meeting for a while waiting for an appropriate time to meet again and I think after the July 25th open house it would make sense to reconvene yes. and um, talk about what did we learn um, and as a group uh, debate how we can um, drive forward on the public school side um, other nonprofits as well as the houses of worship so um, I'll set out a doodle poll or something like that for some date, dates after the 25th of July. And I may even have to give some dates out into August just to make sure, we, or excuse me, September, just to make okay. sure we have people that are going to be around. But I'll schedule something for that. Okay. Great. Uh, ordinance Committee, I know we met. We, met we had twice. a wonderful meeting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we're still pursuing two ordinances that we're really excited about. The first is the Dark Skies Ordinance. And we might get some updates from you tonight, but we're supposed to meet with the Environmental Commission next month. Um, they meet on the same night as us, but next month will be really convenient. They're going to hear a presentation from the professor that's very involved in this effort. Planning Commission. Planning Commission. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Planning Commission is going to hear a presentation from the same professor that we heard the presentation from and then we're going to discuss specific language with planning commission that would uh, we would hope to pass support for in both commissions and then recommend to city council and then the second ordinance is the time of sales ordinance the ordinance that we're seeking to try to implement some sort of energy audit that would be done at time of sale of homes in the city of ann arbor so we've been meeting with two sets of stakeholders. The first is the Ann Arbor Board of Realtors. And I think they, so we met with them. I think they expressed very reasonable concerns, um, namely that it just makes their job harder, which we know, but we're trying to uh, help make sure, tr we want to make sure that any ordinance we pass, um, the additional burden to homeowners would be offset by the benefit to the public um, and to buyers and to try to get the, the Board of Realtors as, as much on board with that as possible. And the second stakeholder is an academic at the University of Michigan who's just about to begin as a professor at the University of Alabama, and she specifically studies these types of ordinances and tries to quantify their benefits. So she's specifically looked at the ordinance in Austin, Texas that um, requires an audit and then adds the results of that audit to the MLS listing for the for homes that go on the market in Austin and she wants to help us set up our ordinance to be as effective as possible and then also kind of track our implementation to help us prove that our ordinance is positively benefiting the community so ideally proving that um, any ordinance we passed would be inse truly incentivizing homeowners to improve the energy efficiency of their homes. And, and remind, remind us, I don't know if I can state this correctly, but okay. I think she told us that her research showed in Austin that homeowners that did make energy improvements actually saw a benefit in the increased value or sales price of their home. Was yeah, that, that was, so is that a good summary or maybe you can yeah. make a better one? <laughs> well, I think there's two interesting but related questions and her research only so far has focused on one, but she's hoping to work with us to answer the second. So the first question is, with the Austin ordinance, did homeowners who made energy efficiency improvements see higher prices because of those improvements? Like, can you isolate any changes in sales prices from 
changes to the general market or changes that are more cosmetic. Can you spe her so her work was able to specifically show that for homeowners that made improvement energy efficiency improvements that those improvements caught earned them higher sales prices. And she did that by looking only at homes that were sold more than once in a certain period of time because you could look at when they were sold without the improvements and when they were sold with improvements. And over a wide body of data and controlling for other variables, she was able to show that. The question that we're also interested in is, uh, does this ordinance incentivize those improvements? So by putting this ordinance into place, do you create a more stable market, essentially, where people can more confidently make those improvements because they know that they're going to get the returns? So a way of providing assurance to the market that if they make invest in the improvements that they'll get a return. So I think a helpful example I gave is that if your furnace goes out and you're buying a new furnace, there's fur you can pay more for an efficient furnace if you know that you're going to be staying in your house for longer than the rate of return on that higher improvement. But if you know you're going to be selling your home in two years, you don't know if the buyer is going to care whether you spent more on that furnace. And because, so they will reap that benefit and you won't. But if you can be assured that you'll be able to promote your high efficiency furnace when you sell your home, you're going to be more likely to buy, to invest in that slightly higher efficiency furnace, even if you won't directly see the return on your investment when, like from savings in your electricity bill, but you'll be able to pass on, the, you'll be able to recoup those savings when you, when you sell your home. So we hope that we can make that case. Okay. And then it's not a question of if you like the environment. It's just a stable market, a question of whether you think markets should have uh, accurate information and, and be stable. So the next steps for our committee are we are having a phone call with the group. So uh, Portland has recently passed a similar ordinance to the type that we want to pass. And so we're going to have a phone call with the organization that executes their version of this ordinance to try to learn more about the process, what, what advice they can give us, what kind of challenges they've faced that they can make us aware of. And um, we also want to ask them about engaging stakeholders and, and how to try to get more people on, on board with this. Great. Yes. So when you say that the home seller yeah. realizes a return on their investment. Return, the other, the, 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 break the, even. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Another way of saying that is mm -hmm. that the house sells for more, which mm -hmm. really goes to our affordability concerns in this community. Yeah. Um, and, and so the, I, yeah. I just want you to know, you know, any time the price of a house is higher, that means that you know, you're excluding people from affording that house. Yeah, it's a good reminder to be careful with my language, but the flip of that is that you should know if you're buying a house that has higher electricity bills, and so then the house should be a pro correspondingly lower. And so one part of this that we're, we're s the ordinance we're most interested in is an ordinance that requires a very easy to understand um, um, audit and so instead of getting presented with like a complex audit that lists every feature you get presented with one number uh, 0 to 10 and that number is and this audit has been um, designed by the Department of Energy and statistically that number is highly correlated to the electricity bill of that house and so you're covering a lot of bases with that and one base is you're essentially getting a a miles per gallon on your house so you can more accurately predict your electricity bill and that should make it maybe not more affordable to buy a house but you can more, accurate, more accurately predict your costs and then it makes it easier on someone who is ex very concerned about cost and, and price. Yeah well I think I think too it, it goes to the I mean it, it's exact parallel to the cafe standards that we just saw that the car prices are more expensive but you recoup that in savings on the um, on the uh, your gas bill, and I think it's the exact same thing when it comes to energy efficiency. That yeah, the and there next are, homeowner would get that savings yeah. benefit. And there are some loan programs that allow for flexibility in a, a, a higher loan 
amount being granted if the energy costs are going to be lower on that than if it was a less efficient house. So I, I think it can work out without reducing affordability. And I think affordability really should include the cost of, of living in that house. If you buy the house at a cheaper price, but you can't afford to live there because it costs too much to heat, and you didn't know that before you bought the house, I think that's a detriment. Yeah. But I think it is, I mean, it would be an interesting conversation to have. I'm assuming, uh, I believe Austin and Portland are uh, probably facing, if not exactly similar, but also have affordability challenges. And oh, so absolutely. I think it would be an interesting question for the Portland folks specifically of how they navigated that issue. Good question. Okay. Good report. Outreach to schools has left. <laughs> so I guess there won't be a report on it. Uh, report from the Environmental Commission. A couple of quick things. First of all, it's probably of interest to everyone that the chairperson of the Environmental Commission, Susan Hutton, stepped down. Um, she had too many things going on um, in her life, including a promotion at her full-time job. And so she's handed the reins over to Bob Needham, who's um, been a long time, or at least for several years, um, commissioner. And he assumed the chair position uh, effective the last meeting. So in the same meeting where she stepped down, he was um, elected as chair. Um, Allison Skinner remains as co-chair. Um, the second thing that uh, happened in the meeting that I think is of general interest is um, I think most of you know, because we've reported on it here, that we've been looking at the various sustainability framework dashboard metrics. Um, and one of the metrics in the Environmental Commission relates to clean water. And the metric in the past was a qualitative metric of the health of the Huron River watershed. Um, and it was just a single snapshot. So if you went to the dashboard, there was an indication of what the health was for the various creek sheds and the Huron River watershed in um, the Ann Arbor area and a qualitative measure. And um, Josh and I worked with uh, the Huron River Watershed Council and encouraged them to come up with a different metric that we could um, easily understand and that could easily be trend charted. And um, in working with them, they came up with um, a new metric that was presented at the Environmental Commission um, what it does is um, it takes data that they already collect on 12 different indicators of a health of a, of a watershed, a creek, or a creek shed. Um, those are graded. Um, the cumulative score of those is calculated. Um, and then the area of that creek shed within the city of Ann Arbor um, is weighted on a percent basis to create then an overall score of the watershed in Ann Arbor. And there are creek sheds in Ann Arbor that range from a, a score of zero to 100, from five to, I believe, 90 something. So five is Allen Creek. Um, and it's basically not a creek. Uh, so it's just uh, mm -hmm. basically a a pipe underground, and it gets five points out of 100 because the water temperature is cold. <laughs> other than that, it doesn't basically get points for any, any other indicator. Um, and then we have a couple of creek sheds that are relatively clean. Um, the overall weighted average for the watershed is actually, for me, was surprisingly low. It's 30. Um, that doesn't mean that the Huron River is necessarily bad. Again, remember, this is a weighted average of each creek shed plus um, the, a part of the Huron River, and then that's area weighted for all of Ann Arbor. But what it does now is allow us to essentially advertise that number, to trend chart it, and then to also say, if we do X in this creek shed, 
then that should raise the creek shed score from five to 10 or whatever it might be. And that would then improve the overall watershed weighted average from 30 to whatever the number might be. And um, we discussed in the meeting uh, actually putting signage up at key points along the Huron River where there's high use, for example, at the liveries or maybe at parking lots that describe how this metric is derived. What are the clean watersheds? What are the not the clean watersheds? As well as some basic information on what residents can do to help improve the quality of the watershed. So we now have a new metric um, that we intend to start to use and plot through what Josh talked about earlier. Um, that reflects then the essentially the water quality or the health of the watershed um, within Ann Arbor. And then the last thing uh, that's of general interest, the next meeting of the Environmental Commission is on the 23rd of August. And that meeting will be devoted essentially solely to interactions with uh, the commission, city staff, and the consulting company, Aptum, that has been hired to support the city in developing an update to its solid resource solid waste resource management plan. Um, so the last plan ran out at the end of December. We don't have a new one in place. The, the intention here is to develop a new plan with new targets, new actions, et cetera. And Aptum has been hired to do that. And one of the things that I hope will be discussed, it's my intention to discuss it, is whether or not um, we really need to spend the full contract amount um, in coming up with a new plan given we never really met the, the targets in the old plan, and can we not just execute on a lot of the projects that were already established at that time and sp spend the money, instead of for consultants, spend the money on actually doing some projects. So those kinds of things will be discussed. That, of course, will be an open meeting, and um, any of you are welcome to come and comment or contribute. Great. That's it. Thank you. Important stuff. Public input. We still have an audience. But no one, it's still the silent whatever. All right. Seeing no input from the public, we will close the public input portion and ask for items for the next agenda, which presumably will be September as we, unless someone feels that there's a really important thing to do in August. Um, we, I think we've had over the years one or two times when we actually met in August, but it also doesn't mean that we can't meet as subcommittees and, and work on the real stuff. Um, if there's a chance we'll have a dark sky ordinance ready. We'll okay, <laughs> that would be good. I think a present, as I mentioned earlier, a presentation on the DTE rate case okay. might, be, might be able to pull something together by then. Wonderful. Or have somebody, somebody pull something else, together? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Am I? I don't think I can make a present. I can't make a presentation to the commission, right? We need another party to. Uh, people have made commission uh, presentations yeah, to the commission. Okay. Uh, I know Chuck did one a little while ago, right? Okay. And there's no. Okay. I think I can also find. There's there are various <laughs> other people who could also yeah, do something well. So. Hopefully, we'll have the Honeywell response by then as well. Okay. Have them do a presentation. Okay. That sounds like probably enough for now. Um, I'm sure there'll be other things that come up and they can be added as they come up. Excuse me. Yes. We had discussed perhaps having a work session with the new sustainability director at, at some point in time. Oh. Um, is that something we're exploring? Ah. Uh, and with the so you're talking about the entire commission being involved, or as a uh, it probably would be a good thing to have at some point, and maybe we should ask her when she thinks that would be a good time to do, or whether she wants to do it as something other than one of the monthly meetings. It could be an, an extra meeting that we had. Um, as long as work, we announced a, it. A work session type of a meeting yes. where it's not as formal. Yeah, we, I mean, we could certainly do that. Now, 
we have been having quarterly work sessions, um, but we sometimes vary it as to not exactly on the quarter. So, um, okay. we'll we'll confer with her. That's an excellent idea. Um, and so, we'll see how things transpire about the the next meeting. But I'll, I'll get in touch with her and talk to her about. But that's that's an excellent idea. Or you can talk to her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or we can both talk to her. Yeah. Uh, anything else? If nothing else, um, I'll call for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We're out of here. Good meeting. <laughs> <laughs>